I am an American soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined, physically and mentally tough, trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert and I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. What I just read out is the Soldier's Creed, which is a sort of rallying cry most soldiers know. It is meant to be a distilled version of their core beliefs, and remind them of the oath they took to not only serve their country, but the people there in it. From such a creed, you would think that the men and women saying it would be amongst the most honorable in the nation, never leaving a man behind, and acting, not in their own selfish interests, but the interest of their fellow soldiers. However, the accuracy of this creed is wanting, given the tremendous amount of corruption and cover-ups that happen within the military, one of which we are going to be talking about today. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, brought to you today by our patrons. Today we are going to be covering the case of Lavina Johnson, a woman whose death was mislabeled as being self-inflicted and how it was clearly a cover-up in an attempt to keep her from justice. Usually, I try not to state something as incendiary as that at the beginning of the video. But as you will come to see in this case, that is more than justified. This video is suggested by Melcat Sight, Twin Man, The Stock Watch Guru, Hope Gallows, and so many of our other subscribers on our video covering the Vanessa Guillen case, as it has to deal with more military incompetence and cover-ups. And I hope I am able to do Lavina justice today. I'm going to be leaving resources in the description box down below, along with the change.org petition to reopen the case because simply talking about this has not yielded the appropriate results. I strongly implore you share any of the resources in the description of this video, or even the video itself, whether that be on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or whatever social media you have, using the hashtag JusticeForLavina. Pressure your local news station to talk about how this case is still being covered up. Tweet it to your local congressman or woman. Do what you can. It has been widely established that there was a cover-up in regards to this case. The fact that it hasn't been looked into past this is ridiculous. If something like this occurred today, it would be trending 100 times over. There would be a hefty investigation, and we would fight to get answers. I can say that with relative certainty, given what happened in the Vanessa Guillen case, which is alarmingly similar, we are not powerless in this case, and we haven't been for some time. This is a case where justice wasn't served, and will continue to not be served as long as people simply watch videos about this subject and move on with their lives. There are videos on this platform talking about this with a million views and still nothing has been done. So let's try and change that. With all that said, let us begin. Lavina Johnson was someone who, in her short time on this earth, accomplished more than your average person. She was the kind of person who, when she set a goal, didn't sway from it until it was in her hands, at which point she would set a new one and keep moving forward. If Lavina told you she was going to do something, chances were she was already on her way to accomplishing it and doing so flawlessly. She was a determined, principled woman who knew what she wanted and didn't believe in defeat. Lavina was born July 27, 1985, to her parents John and Linda Johnson. She was the couple's first girl and their fourth child altogether, and they knew from the moment she was born that they had struck gold. Lavina was just one of those kids who seemed to get everything immediately. She wasn't fussy or difficult, she never seemed to act out, and it seemed that she could put absolutely anyone under her spell. When she was just four months old, she was already winning awards and exceeding everyone's expectations, as the church her family attended gave her the Baby of the Year Award, which her family boasted about. When she was just four years old, she began to sing in the church choir, and whenever she would be set to perform in any holiday pageant for her church or school, she would spend weeks preparing, putting in hours of her free time to make sure she did the best that she could. She shone bright in her community never missing a mark or fumbling, and it seemed that she was just born to excel, which some did say was a bit frustrating. According to some of her peers, Lavina had a tendency to make others look bad by comparison, though they had a hard time holding that against her, given how gracious and kind she was. Lavina was just that type of person who spent hours of her own time working for others' benefit. She took care of the people around her, including her young sisters, and there was nothing more important to her than uplifting the ones she loved by giving her all to see them succeed. Everyone knew that if you asked Alvina to do something, 
she would do it, and she would always do her best. Lavina's caring nature wasn't kept to just her family and friends, though. She also had a passion for animals and their well-being. When she was in the fifth grade, Lavina decided that she was going to, on her own accord, become a vegetarian. Not only that, she decided she was going to join People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, aka PETA. At just 11 years old, she began giving her own money to the organization, wanting to help them in their quest to stop animal abuse and make the world a friendlier place. When Lavina was in high school, she quickly garnered the reputation of being a dependable, good girl. She didn't feel the need to waste her time messing around the way most teenagers do. In fact, some of her teachers would go so far as to say she seemed to have matured past her peers and seemed to relate more to them than people her own age. She was known for the charity work she was constantly participating in, as well as her good grades, which landed her on the honor roll. At the same time, she began to realize what she wanted to do with her life, and as usual, her goals included supporting the people she loved most, her family. According to her father, Lavina wanted to attend a performing arts college with the hopes of becoming an established movie producer. She wanted to help put real stories onto the big screen, but more than that, she wanted to turn some of the books that her father had written into movies. She also wanted to create opportunities in the industry for her brothers John and Jermaine, and hoped that in time, when she was able to become a well-established producer, she would be able to get all of their music recognized and get the recognition it deserved. She had spoken to the entire family about creating a family-run production company, with her brothers working in music and her working in movies, and creating a solid foundation for themselves together. That way they could all profit. But first, she would need to go to college. Her parents were supportive of her extending her education, and in fact, encouraged it, knowing that she was going to make something of herself in whatever field she went into. They had saved up a hefty amount of money with her education in mind, knowing that she was going to go far. Lavina wanted to go to school in California, and that would mean out-of-state tuition. She also knew that her parents would be paying for her sister's college at around the same time which would put a significant financial strain on the family. Always the considerate daughter, she began to look for ways to lessen their burden. It was through that that Lavina stumbled upon the U.S. military and decided that she would join after high school. Her parents were not incredibly supportive of this decision, despite both of them having worked in the army in some capacity. Neither thought that she should go into it herself, knowing that the environment wasn't great for young women. Her father, John, tried to get Lavina to reconsider, telling her that he didn't mind working harder to allow her to pursue her dreams, and that the burden wouldn't be as bad as she thought. But she was persistent that this was a necessary step to achieving her own dreams on her own terms, and informed them that she was simply telling them her decision and not asking for permission. A year after graduating from Hazelwood Senior High School with honors, Lavina was assigned to the 129th Corps Support Battalion, and deployed to serve a tour in Balad, Iraq. She had no idea that only eight weeks after, she would be murdered eight days before her 20th birthday, and the army that she served would try to cover up her death. From the moment Lavina touched down in Iraq, she was in near constant communication with her parents, unlike so many soldiers who would be without the ability to talk to their families for weeks or months at a time. Lavina worked in the communication center, which essentially acted like an internet cafe. She therefore had plenty of access to various forms of communication, which she used to keep in near constant contact with her family. In fact, one of the things her friends and fellow soldiers knew about Lavina was that she came from an incredibly close-knit family, who she adored. She called them often, relaying stories about her time there and what she was doing, and when she could, she also sent them letters. Lavina was clearly in good spirits, although she did begrudge the fact that other male soldiers looked down on her for her gender. This was, of course, not unique to Lavina, as the U.S. military has been shown to be an unwelcoming place to women, with one in three female soldiers reporting sexual abuse of some kind. Verbal belittlement and disrespect was seen as normal and expected. This kind of mocking and minimizing female soldiers came at a cost to Lavina. In one instance, while working at the communication center, she was closing up for the night and requested a small group of male soldiers to leave. She informed them that she needed to close the center and that they had to vacate the premises. But they laughed in her face, telling her they weren't going anywhere, and then pretended they couldn't hear her. She tried multiple times to get these men to leave, but they continued to ignore her, until finally, she had to get a male authority figure to do the same. The moment a male counterpart addressed them, 
the male who would refuse to listen or acknowledge Lavina immediately left without issue. Instead of reprimanding the male soldiers for not listening to her, respecting her position, or even just being courteous, Lavina was reprimanded and told that she needed to assert herself more. In essence, it was her fault she was being unfairly ignored and disrespected by her peers, because she didn't seem serious enough and didn't command respect. If she was tougher or carried herself in a more intimidating way, it would be better for her. Never mind the fact that Lavina had asserted herself, and they should have simply respected her position because of her job. Their actions were still placed on her. Lavina was a positive and strong-willed person, and thought that she would be able to tough it out quietly. In her mind, she believed that the majority of men who were treating her poorly were doing it because they thought less of her, and it was up to her to change their expectations. If she were to report their behavior or any of the transgressions that she experienced, she believed that that would make her look even worse, because it would show she was weaker than them. Her complaining at all about their actions would just show how she couldn't take a joke and needed special treatment, so she instead kept quiet. Quiet, choosing to endure their disrespect with the hope that things would turn around as she showed them that she was valuable. But as we know, that isn't the case, and never is the case. After relaying this story to her family in a phone call, her father was furious. John, who again, experienced in the service as a doctor, knew that how Lavina was being treated wasn't right and would likely not change unless she did something about it. The disrespect that was being thrown her way, specifically by her superior, who had reprimanded her instead of the men around her, was likely going to get worse before it got any better. And he urged Lavina to get a battle buddy. A battle buddy is a person who acts as a kind of protection in the service. They're a fellow soldier who you spend 24 hours a day with seven days a week. The battle buddy system was created to develop a sense of responsibility and accountability with soldiers, and also reduce the likelihood of any misconduct, and more specifically, sexual misconduct, which was running rampant in the military. It was also meant as a system to lower the rate of suicides, which had likewise begun to be a problem. John wanted Lavina to get a battle buddy. That way, if she was taken down by another general, or if other male soldiers continued to harass her, she would have a second party who could protect her and act as a witness. Lavina placated her father and told him that things would be fine, but he stood firm. And told her if these things continued to occur, he would put in a request for her. He knew how these men's minds worked after being around them for a number of years, and he didn't trust that they would treat her right. Little did he know that his fears had already materialized. Unbeknownst to her father was the fact that at some point, before she had been disrespected in the communication center, Lavina had been raped by a fellow serviceman. The details of what happened are unclear, but what was known is that after she had been raped, she had gotten an STD and was currently getting treatment for that from the doctors on site. This should have led to there being reports taken and a full investigation into her claims. However, it appeared that the military had no records regarding the rape or the actions taken by their staff afterwards, meaning that it is likely that the man who did this wasn't reprimanded or penalized at all. Many speculate that while Lavina had wanted to put in a report herself, she was dissuaded by the people she told and made to feel as if it was her fault the rape had occurred. That said, it is also possible that reports regarding her assault were destroyed after her death. Lavina hadn't told anyone in her private life about the assault, and it seemed as though she was trying to move past it, which might be why she bristled at the idea of getting a battle buddy, as she felt like she didn't want to stir any more feathers after her assault and wanted to try to go on as if nothing had happened. On July 17th, 2005, Lavina called home around 7 a.m. and spoke with her parents. She was excited because she had just gotten word that she would be going home a lot sooner than she had expected, and she was going to be coming home around Christmas time, which was her favorite time of year, and she didn't want her family to start decorating without her. She was excited, making plans, and looking forward to the next couple of months. Before ending the call, her mom had asked if she wanted to speak to her siblings who were still asleep. Lavina said no, and that she would call back in the next couple of days to catch up with them, and hung up. But that call would never come, because according to the military, two days later, she would take her own life. According to the military, the following is what happened on July 19, 2005. This is the official sequence of events according to the CID and military officials. Lavina had spent the day working in the communications office as normal. There had been no distressing or concerning incidents that had taken place that day, and Lavina was seen by multiple people, laughing and acting her usual self. She locked up the building after work and set out with an unnamed male friend to get some snacks for the military store. The man who walked with Lavina to the store 
and then to her barracks, stated that she was in a good mood, making jokes about work and seeming in relatively high spirits. From there, she went back to her barracks to get ready for physical training with two of her other friends. Lavina had changed out of her regular clothes and into her physical training outfit, but instead of going to physical training and meeting up with her friends, she instead printed out emails from her short-term ex-boyfriend, who had recently broken up with her, and got her military-issued M16 rifle and walked to a contractor's tent belonging to Kellogg, Brown, and Root. There, she set the emails on fire using an aerosol can and then somehow shot herself with the M16, despite the fact that she was only 5'1 and wouldn't have been able to reach the trigger if it was placed against her head or in her mouth. Lavina had, according to the military, become incredibly distressed since her boyfriend had broken up with her and wanted to end her life because of that. Even though the pair had only been dating for about two months, they stated that Lavina was in love with him and couldn't bear the rejection. The army noted that she had begun eating a lot more ice cream in the weeks after the breakup, and that change of diet meant that she most likely had fallen into a serious, life-threatening depression. She had also begun to smoke cigarettes, according to the other soldiers who were interviewed after her death. These two changes in her life, according to the official reports, were enough to show that Lavina had been in such a poor mental place that she decided to kill herself. But, as you will see, that could not be what actually occurred. A day or so after Lavina's death, her parents were informed, albeit vaguely. A uniformed soldier showed up at their doorstep and told them that their daughter was dead. The Johnsons were understandably devastated, but also confused. Lavina hadn't been in active combat and was in perfect health, and she had just called to say she would be back in time for Christmas. She made plans to call back and speak to her brothers and sister, and she had been genuinely excited for what the future had in store for her. There was no reasonable explanation, sans a third party taking her life, that would explain how she died. According to John and Linda, the soldier then let it slip that Lavina had ended her own life. When pressed for more about his statement, he then backtracked and said that he didn't mean to say that she had killed herself, and that Lavina's death was currently being investigated, and that they would be receiving a phone call within the next couple days with more information. But at once, John and Linda knew that something was wrong about the situation. When the call did come, the information they received made little to no sense. John had experience in the army, and knew his daughter, so when they told him that she had shot herself in the head with an M16 rifle, he knew that couldn't have happened. She wouldn't have been able to reach the trigger, given her short stature. The gunshot was also on the left side of her head, and Lavina was right-handed, meaning it was unlikely that she had shot herself. Not only that, but when they were given the results of the autopsy, it showed that Lavina had not fired the weapon that killed her, as there was no gunshot residue on either of her hands or any part of her body. Had she shot herself with an M16, there would have been gunshot residue on her, but according to their own evidence, there was none. When he brought up his concerns, the representative for the army tried to placate him, saying that she had somehow managed to kill herself in the way they had stated, even if it made no sense. The representative likewise informed him that they would be sending the body back for burial, and that it would be better for the family to do a closed casket, as Lavina's body was in poor condition. They tried in earnest to pressure the family not to look at Lavina's body, but the Johnsons didn't listen and felt compelled to see their daughter one last time before the burial. The Johnsons' insistence on seeing their daughter would then lead to them making some of the most critical discoveries in this case. Despite the army stating her body would be too traumatizing to see, she wasn't as brutalized as they had said. It was clear that Lavina had gone through a tremendous amount of physical trauma before she died, but the injuries she had sustained didn't make sense if she had killed herself. Instead, it appeared as if Lavina had been badly beaten before her passing. Her face was bruised, her lip was busted, multiple of her teeth had been broken and loose, as if she had been struck in the face. She had scratch marks on her neck, and it appeared as if she had broken her nose before she died, but the military reset it to try to conceal the injury. The bullet wound was on the left side of her head, despite her being right-handed and appeared to be too small to have been caused by an M16. In fact, reports would go on to say that it appeared to be a gunshot from a small handgun, not Lavina's military-issued rifle. But there was something even more alarming about Lavina's body, and that was the fact that the military had decided to glue her white dress gloves to her hands, preventing them from being seen by anyone. John and his wife tried to get the gloves off at one point, but were disturbed to find them adhered to their daughter's body. They asked the funeral parlor 
about the action, and they were informed that she had the gloves on when they gathered her body from the military. It was later found that her hands had third-degree burns on them, and the gloves had been placed on them to conceal that fact. John would later go on to posit that the gloves were placed there to eliminate and destroy any further evidence that could have been left on Lavina's body, and to further consolidate the lies the military had been telling them. John and Linda knew something was wrong from the moment they were told that Lavina had killed herself. Even if she had been upset about her ex-boyfriend, she had never made mention of it to anyone around her in a way that made them concerned for her emotional well-being. They asked her friends in the army about her actions prior to her death, and one friend stated that while Lavina loved her ex and was sad that they had broken up, she wasn't too upset about it, quoting her as saying, she knew that they would get back together the moment she got back home, and it was just a distance thing. So Lavina deciding to end her life over this made no sense. What also struck the Johnsons as odd was that the army seemed insistent that her death had absolutely nothing to do with the sexual assault she had faced while deployed. Though she had not spoken to her family or peers about it, Lavina's sexual assault had taken a toll on her, as most assaults do. Lavina had to get treatment for the still unknown STD she had contracted, and given the lack of follow-up or reporting, whatever she did claim to the doctors hadn't been pursued, meaning the man who had assaulted her wasn't penalized. It seemed that whenever the Johnsons talked about the assault on their daughter, or inquired more into what had occurred, the army would become unresponsive, and try to tell them that Lavina wasn't upset about what had happened in that instance, that it had been no big deal and she had moved on from it, so they should as well. But John didn't let up though, and inquired as to if the man who had assaulted his daughter could have had anything to do with her death. He was then told that they had looked into it, and ruled him out entirely. But also, they didn't know who had originally assaulted her anyways, so any follow-up would be fruitless. John then inquired as to if there had been a rape kit done on Lavina during her autopsy, to which the military said there hadn't been, as there had been no reason to have done so because Lavina had clearly killed herself. But when John brought up the close proximity to her being sexually assaulted and her being killed, and how it should have been standard operating procedure to run one, the army relayed to him that if he wanted any more information, he would have to go through their legal representatives, cutting him off entirely. At that point, both John and Linda were tired, heartbroken, and distraught. Going against the United States Army was no small task, and hiring their own legal counsel to investigate what was going on was something that seemed daunting and impossible. But after talking it over with each other, they realized that there was simply nothing else they could do. Lavina deserved to get justice, and so they began their crusade to get her name and case in front of as many people as possible. John began going on to different shows, writing news stations, and talking about his daughter's death to the public. And almost at once, people stopped and took notice. Nothing about what the military had said made sense. And the more people who heard about it, the angrier people became. More men and women began coming forward, talking about how their daughters had likewise died under suspicious circumstances in the military, and how it had been written off as a suicide without much investigation. This was not a one-time thing, and John speaking up, gave others the courage to do so as well. As John continued to speak to the media, the U.S. Army responded, hoping to quell the outcry against them, and they released a 315-page file containing all the notes on the investigation on her death. But things would only get more confusing from there. Because of the insistence of the Johnson family and their refusal to accept that their daughter had killed herself, the military was forced to release the investigative documents surrounding the case. It appeared that they believed that the release of these documents would lead to people agreeing that Lavina had killed herself, and there hadn't been a cover-up. However, the exact opposite is true, given how little of the evidence makes sense with the story they put forward. According to the document, after Lavina had shot herself, Multiple people responded and found Lavina dead, and portions of the contractor's tent on fire. But the stories given about how Lavina was found don't exactly match up. According to the documents, the first two people to find Lavina stated that they found her dead, under a bench that was in the tent, meaning that she had shot herself standing, fallen, then somehow slid under the bench on her own accord. Which, given how instantaneous a shot to the head is at killing someone, isn't possible. Or, she had laid herself down under the bench, then shot herself. Or, a third party had moved the bench over her after dying. A third person who arrived on the scene shortly thereafter stated that when he saw Lavina, she was on the ground, 
not under a bench, and the M16 was lying across her body. He also stated that parts of her body were smoking and slightly on fire, which is a huge detail that the first two witnesses didn't notice. Who had set parts of her body on fire? How had the previous two missed that her body was smoking? And why did they not see the rifle on top of her? A fourth person arrived after being called to provide aid, as they were a doctor. They didn't note that Lavino was on fire or smoking, and stated that her rifle was cradled over her left shoulder, not directly across her body as previously noted. He then moved the rifle in order to check for signs of life, to which he said there were none. Three other men, likewise, reported that when they found Lavina around the same time as the doctor, she was lying face up, with her right arm covering her face, and the rifle not stretched out over her body or cradled over her left shoulder, but on her left wrist. She likewise was not on fire or under a bench. However, in photos, the rifle would be shown to be a couple feet away from her body, completely removed from her person. Another party discussed how a civilian had flagged him down as he was driving by and informed him of a fire in a dead body in the contractor's tent. He described seeing flames near the tent that Lavina was in, and the two soldiers had carried a burning bench outside of the tent and were trying to put out the flames. He then looked in and saw Lavina who was obviously dead, but not smoking or on fire. The various statements that were given seemed similar enough to the military, but the key notable differences raised red flags to those reading them and when they were released. Why is it that no one who found her that night could recall if she was on fire or not? And how are there so many discrepancies about that? How did her body get out from under the bench if she had shot herself and fallen straight down? Was the bench on fire when they found it? And how did she get under the flaming bench? Where was the gun when people originally arrived? On her body, in her arms, or elsewhere? How many people moved the gun before it was photographed? The document went on to showcase various interviews with her friends and colleagues. The vast majority of statements said she was as chipper and bright as ever. People who stated she was around every day talked about how continuously upbeat and peppy she was, and how excited she was to potentially go home for the holidays. A separate account from another trusted friend noted that she had in fact made jokes about suicide, but they were clearly jokes and never serious, always made in hyperbolic manner. All except one statement seemed to agree that Lavina was a bright woman who wouldn't have purposely injured herself in such a heinous way. However, that lone statement contradicts itself and stands out as being incredibly odd and suspicious. The name of the person who gave the statement has been redacted, so we will just refer to them by their pronouns, she and her. She stated that she knew Lavina since they were in deployment classes at Fort Campbell. She stated last month that Lavina found out she had an STD from a sexual assault. She then stated that during the last week of her life, Lavina changed her eating habits, gave her some of her possessions, and began smoking. During the past month, Lavina had stated several times that she hated her and wished she was dead. This was really the only account that validated the very idea that Lavina would want to hurt herself, and it went against a lot of other accounts of how she was. Though it is feasible that Lavina only acted in this certain manner around this one person, others who were closer to her in the unit who spoke to her family, denied a lot of these claims, and stated that when Lavina would say she was going to kill herself as a joke, she would do so when she would stub her toe or messed up in some small way, and it was abundantly clear that she was joking. They went on to say that Lavina hadn't changed her eating habits in any extreme way. It was because they were in the desert in an extreme heat. Regardless, it seemed as if the military had gotten this lone statement and decided that it was the truth, disregarding all of the other statements. The report then went on to state that the lack of gunshot residue wasn't necessarily an issue and didn't prove that she didn't shoot herself. The entire document did little to comfort the Johnsons or make it appear that Lavina had somehow done this to herself. In fact, it appeared to discredit itself multiple times over, making those who read it more suspicious of the people who were trying to push the narrative that she would have hurt herself when there were so many people who loved her who were stating otherwise. While the majority of it was unhelpful, it only seemed to add to the Johnsons' frustrations. There was something in it that piqued their interest. Amongst poorly scanned photos of the gun and the tent where Lavina died, someone had scanned in a CD-ROM, stating that it had contents that were pertinent to the case although what exactly was on it was unknown. John immediately knew that whatever was in the case was vitally important, and he put in another Freedom of Information Act request on it, saying that he was entitled to all the information revolving around her death. The military denied this request and told him that the CD contained private parties' information, but John continued to persist, once again getting the media and politicians involved. In order to get the CD, 
the Johnsons reached out to Senator Lacey Clay and spoke to him about the case. Publicly, Clay asked the military to hand over the CD, and when they refused, he went around them and was able to procure it anyways. And lo and behold, the contents of the CD further proved that what had happened to Lavina could not have been suicide. The CD contained full-color photos of her body at the crime scene, how it had been positioned, and where everything was when she was found. There were also photos of her prior to her autopsy, photos of her naked body and the trauma that had been inflicted upon her, and it went well beyond a shot to the head. Lavina had bruises and scratches all up and down her torso, which the military could not explain. It also appeared that there were bite marks on her, and teeth marks were physically present. Her elbow had been popped out of place and fully dislocated. The back of her clothes were covered in dirt and debris, as if she had been dragged a long distance prior to her death. Strangely though, it appeared that someone had deliberately tried to set her naked body on fire, as her back had been charred, but had redressed her afterward and dragged her body a short distance. Her lower stomach had been beaten so badly that it was entirely bruised and blackened. The injuries that she sustained to her body in no way matched a simple suicide, and it seemed obvious that she had been brutally beaten before her death, most likely by more than one party. Someone or a group of people had bitten her, kicked her, and set her alight and dragged her, and there was no way she had caused this damage to herself. But unfortunately, there was more. The photos that were taken of Lavina's naked body at her autopsy showed that a caustic substance that Dr. Johnson believed to be lye was poured into her vagina, most likely to eliminate any DNA evidence that could have been tied to a rape. As a reminder, the military coroner had stated that they hadn't done a rape kit on Lavina or done any examination of her sexual organs after her death, because in their words, there was no reason to think that anything involving this crime had been sexual. Even though he was the one who had taken the photos showcasing how her vagina had been corroded with some sort of acid, but sure, there was no reason to think she had suffered any sexual trauma despite there being acid on her sexual organs. There were also pictures of blood outside of the tent, as if she had been moved multiple times, or beaten outside and then dragged into the tent to be killed. The photos made no sense, and the more evidence that they were given access to, the more questions the Johnsons had. John went to the media once more, and using the intrigue the case garnered, they were able to afford to have a second autopsy done on Lavina and even more was found. The second autopsy was able to show that Lavina had her neck broken and that prior to her death, parts of her vagina, tongue, and anus had been removed. The first autopsy and the medical examiner who conducted it never mentioned any of that and likewise stated that he hadn't removed parts of her body, which again leads many to believe that she had in fact been brutally sexually tortured prior to her death. John worked with multiple media outlets to try and get this information in front of more people, but oddly enough, two major corporations who were interested in running stories on this case pulled out at the last second without explanation. It is widely believed that they pulled out because the U.S. Army ran ads on their networks. John worked hard to keep the story in the news to try to get answers and justice for his daughter, but as time has gone on, fewer people have paid attention, and most have just accepted Lavina's death as being part of a cover-up. Despite all the evidence that has been found through the second autopsy and other criminal analysts, the military has still refused to reopen the case and look at it with fresh eyes. They stated that the evidence speaks for itself and that their biggest downfall in regards to Lavina came down to miscommunication between them and her family. But that cannot be the case. So much of their own evidence disproves their own theory as to what happened. Why did Lavina have bite marks on her upper torso? Why did it appear that she'd been brutally beaten before her death? Who poured corrosive acid on her vagina? Why were parts of her tongue, vagina, and anus cut prior to her death? Why wasn't a rape kit done when her vagina had clear signs of trauma? Who sexually abused her? And why is it that only one person purported that she was suicidal? These are some of the questions that still remain, that the military refuses to acknowledge. In their public statements surrounding Lavina, they try to ignore their own evidence, showing that what they are saying cannot be true, and it's time for that to stop. Lavina was killed July 2005. It is currently May 2022. 17 years have passed without justice. Normally on this channel, our videos allow for passive consumption of information. With the length and nature of what we post here, I never expect people to want to take action from what we are talking about. While we ask you to share the video if you like the content and engage with it if you want, we never have a call to arms or a rallying cry. However, that is not the case today. Lavina's death is still almost 20 years after the fact, labeled as a suicide, 
The military has refused to reopen the case and look at it for what it is, and her family still has to deal with the absolute disrespect that this entails. Most who have looked into this case, politicians, former military, and more, all agree that something happened here and it properly wasn't investigated in order to protect the person or people who committed the crime, but they refuse to move forward past that. However, we are not powerless. With the dawn of social media, cover-ups like this one can be called out and brought to light, and we can utilize shame to make a positive forward motion. The shame and attention that was used to force Fort Hood into looking into the Vanessa Guillen case needs to be used now. Please click the link in the description and go sign the change.org petition to reopen Lavina's case. Tweet out using hashtag justice for Lavina and tweet to your local news station, your local political leaders, and people you know who can make a difference. The more attention we can get to this case, the more shame we can bring to the people who refuse to reopen the investigation, the more likely we are to actually figuring out what happened to Lavina and the public can know who killed her. Lavina was murdered in 2005 and it's been 17 years. She deserves to be at peace. Thank you for watching this video. If you have a case suggestion or want me to look into something for you, feel free to leave a comment or email me.